The vast open world that thrives upon the life given to us by the great Erd Tree. Its sheer size alone inspires awe, and its luminous branches are visible from every corner of the continent at any time of the day or night. Drawing power from the Elden Ring, the Erd Tree confers grace to those that are worthy of its blessing. It is said that its roots hold the very land together, and that all life born here eventually returns to it. Welcome to the Lands Between. The Verdant Hill of Lipgrave Life here is blessed with the warm rays of the sun and the cool breeze brought by the ocean to the west. It was a sea of grass and dense forest. Limgrave has no shortage of herbivores that thrive here. Sheep roam free, grazing on the fertile pastures. Spring hares hop about, foraging for nuts and roa fruit. Deer take shelter amongst the thick of the woods, eating leaves, seeds, and even mushrooms. And boars survey the underbrush in search of roots, grubs, and other morsels. And with this many herbivores about, it's no surprise Limgrave has its share of predators as well. Wolves. For these pack hunters, Limgrave is a great haven full of food and shelter, and the open plains make it perfect for sport. Their leader, a white wolf, looks upon from a vantage point, keeping a close eye for any threats to prevent any harm to his packmates. Hunts rarely go amiss, and the potential prey are so numerous that they are seldom want for food. But the wolves that live just north of here don't enjoy the same luxury. The ever wind bound Storm Hill. A high plateau buffeted by cold air, ceaseless winds, and sweeping mist just outside the Stormvale Castle. Such conditions make hunting rather difficult. Prey isn't as abundant here, and the poor visibility combined with the howling winds make it hard to track and locate prey. At least, in the traditional way. Because these storm wolves have found another means to the hunt. Through methods unclear, these wolves have found a way to ride the very winds themselves, stalking prey in the Stormhill Forest and ambushing them when they least expect it. Their adapted way of hunting is so effective, the Stormhill Wolves have become one of Limgrave's most successful predators, despite the limitations. But with more mouths to feed, greater risks must be taken to keep the entire pack from going hungry. And unbeknownst to this hunting group, 
their most elite warriors had gone out this morning to hunt larger prey. And with the Alpha leading the hunt, they've managed to corner their quarry. But a lesser rune bearer is not an opponent to be trifled with. With their strongest members and leader now dead, the rest of the pack seek to avenge their fallen comrades. The wolves descend from the winds, cutting off the lesser rune bear's only exit out of the ravine. The forward team keeps the bear's attention as they close in to surround their target from the rear. But what the lesser rune bear lacks in number, he makes up for in sheer size and brute strength. Standing nearly 8 meters tall and weighing over 6,000 kilos, he is a force to be reckoned with. One after another, storm wolves fall in battle. But even as their numbers dwindle, they are undeterred. They will fight down to the last wolf, even if it means their death. With the last of the storm wolves dead, the lesser rune bear returns to its home, battered, bruised, but alive. Its home is just south of the ravine, in Mistwood. Unlike the turbulent winds of Stormhill, the air here seems to be completely still by comparison. The thick mist that blankets the area veils any traces of the lesser rune bear's escape into the woods. The standing air and low visibility have made it impossible for the wolves to track the bear any further without risking getting lost or running into unknown threats. Mistwood is home to a great number of bears that take advantage of the dense fog to hide and hunt alike. As a result, the wildlife here have learned to take extra caution as to not make much noise, lest they betray their location to nearby predators. And it is here that the lesser rune bear comes to lick its wounds and recover from battle. The evolution of this species is still a mystery. But the minor ur tree overlooking the mistwood to the east may provide a clue to their origin. Much like the ur tree itself, minor ur trees are similar beacons of life and grace that grow throughout the lands between. The presence of grace is potent enough that the areas surrounding them are their own microcosms. These tarnished golden sunflowers, for instance, can only be found near minor ur trees, always facing the near sources of grace, and though wilted and faded, they still retain their holy essence. Teardrop scarabs can be found all throughout the lands between. But these crimson teardrop scarabs have come to gather here at the Mistwood Minor Tree to extract crimson tears full of vitality from its roots. How they are able to extract and store this vital essence within this delicately woven ball of magical branches remains a mystery to us. But these containers serve both as a home and a source of food for their larvae once they've hatched from the eggs that lie within.
The fireflies that live in nearby ponds have evolved over time under the minor ur tree's grace to give off a magical, alluring golden light, which is said to attract runes. And it is perhaps under a similar effect that the lesser rune bears came to be. Generations of evolution under the influence of minor grace from the minor ur tree. As the sun sets across the lands between, the ur tree shines even more brilliantly across the night sky. And for giant bats, its glow signals their time to eat. Their eyes are now perfect to see clearly in this darker environment. They hunt larger mammals, including humans, for their meat and blood. And luckily for them, there's no shortage of tarnished just waiting to become their next meal. They can be found all across the lands between, but are usually found near cliffs or open plains. Giant bats typically travel in groups, and on rare occasions, are led by a matriarch. The Weeping Peninsula a morose land connected only by the Bridge of Sacrifice to the very southern tip of Limgrave. The never-ending rain and overcast skies creates a gloomy yet peaceful atmosphere. And it is here along the southern coast of the peninsula that we hear a melancholy song. Its mournful melody has lured many a travelers to her enchanting voice, only to be met with death. It sings in an ancient language, one nearly lost to time, only known by a handful of scholars. Alas, that land, once blessed, now has diminished. We, destined to be mothers, now become tarnished. We have lamented, and we have shed tears. But no one consoles us. Golden one, at whom were you angry? The year-round rain that douses the weeping peninsula leaves no plants wanting for water. But the constant overcast skies often leave them thirsty for the sunlight. So rather than relying on it, these Miranda flowers have evolved to become carnivorous. The sprouts of a Miranda flower can roam the land in search of animals to hunt using specialized roots for locomotion. Their weapon of choice? Toxic pollen. Silent, deadly, and effective. And with their prey dead, the sprout moves to dig their roots into their prey's body, where they will spend the next few days slowly digesting the remains. As a Miranda sprout reaches maturity, it must choose a final resting place from which it will carry out the rest of its life. 
A prime location is key to the survival of its budding offsprings. A parent must be able to protect its nearby sprouts if needed, and also be in range to exchange pollens with others of its kind. Their pollen, known by perfumers as Miranda powder, is collected at the very tip of their stamen, where strong winds and insects can carry their pollen to other flowers. And in some cases, the stray, poisonous pollen can aid their young sprouts in hunting. This bridge on the southern outskirts of the demi-human forest leading to the Weeping Peninsula's minor earth tree is a death trap for many, but a food trove for this bunch of Miranda flowers just beneath it. On windy days, an updraft from the south can carry their toxic pollens onto the bridge, engulfing it in a deadly cloud of poison killing anyone that happens to be passing over it to the valley below, where they are slowly devoured by the sprouts. For millennia, the mystical moon of Renala has bewitched the minds of many, as it bequeaths a magic upon the lands between that opens the eyes to the world of the unseen. Horsemen of the Knight's Cavalry begin their ghostly patrol, revealed by the silver light, waiting to challenge any who crosses their path. While deathbirds begin to cast moonbound shadows, bringing swift death to unsuspecting travelers from above. However, not all creatures of the moon are hostile. Spirit jellyfish, such as these, are usually docile, and serve to mark where the fallen may have been buried. Each of these jellyfish is said to be the spiritual reincarnation of those who have passed into death while lost in some manner. They seek to protect the area where the fallen was laid to rest, but contain a deadly poison for self-defense should they find themselves under attack. And as the night ages and the temperatures begins to drop even further, it is here we find a group of land octopi along the western shores of Limbrave. They are found along coasts and around large lakes and rivers. Their ability to osmoregulate their body depending on whether they are living near fresh water or salt water makes them especially suited for this environment. The females are significantly larger than the surrounding males, more than 20 times their size and their sharp beaks can grow to be as long as a fully grown male. They navigate and forage for food using two of their massive tentacles, while the others are used for movement and protection. While individuals can survive off of scavenging birds, fish, and even mammals, the survival of their species is dependent on the consumption of humans. Females only lay eggs after having eaten human flesh, and will only lay as many eggs as there are nutrients available. Each batch of eggs is carefully moved onto her back, where they are protected and kept moist until a male comes along to fertilize them. And once fertilized, the eggs can take up to six months to hatch often depending on the quality of the human blood they have circulating through their eggs.
While the lion's share of waterbound carcasses often go to the land octopus, the smaller particulates that flow down the river are usually cleaned up by young grave crabs in Akheel Lake. And they aren't picky. Grave crabs will eat any and everything that was once alive, be it mammal, fish, clams, snails, or even other crabs, as well as decaying vegetation. They are one of nature's most thorough cleanup crew. Male grave crabs can grow to be more than three meters in height and are often very territorial. As they approach maturity, their right claw begins to grow considerably larger than the other, and it is with this claw that they fight off potential predators and other grave crabs to secure feeding grounds as well as potential mates. But territorial as they are, they know very well to stay away from their neighbors, the land squirts. Slow, bulbous, but full of deadly poison. They wander the lake using their tentacles to sense their environment, searching for anything suitable to eat. Their mouths are located at the very bottom, and with no beaks or teeth to help it eat, it instead spits out digestive enzymes onto its meal and then sucks up the partially digested remains, a process that can take days or even weeks depending on the size of their meal. And when there's a particularly large meal, pods of land squirts can gather over time. But despite taking a long time to eat, they are rarely disturbed by others. The masses you see on the tops and sides of their heads are siphons, one for taking in air, the other to expel it. And when threatened, they expel a poisonous vapor from this special organ to deter potential predators. And while it may be enough to deter most others, it would do little against the master of the lake. Great Flying Dragon, Egg Heel. A creature so great and fearsome, none dare challenge it. In fact, the opposite has since happened. Worshippers looking to die by his hands. Thanks to them, Agil has had no shortage of food and no reason to return to its homeland in Kaled, far to the east. Limgrave's climate is thought by many to be ideal. The mild temperatures and weather conditions make it very habitable for many a plants and animals. Even those that live in areas that pose an environmental challenge have adapted effectively to thrive in their own habitats. While there may be an ocean of space separating Limgrave from the Erd tree, the roots of the Ur tree are spread far and wide, granting life and grace to all that reside in the lands between. Our next venture 
takes us north past Stormvale Castle into the misty lake of Liernia. To follow our journey further into the lands between, consider subscribing to the Borealis Bestiary channel. If you wish to further support the channel, consider sharing this video with other tarnished or donating runes to sponsor future expeditions.